Episode 13 August 23rd, 1914 I Walked With Fear by Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Osborne, DSO or AMC read by John Goodman Lieutenant Colonel Osborne was at Mons as a medical officer of the famous cavalry regiment, the 4th Dragoon Guards, the first British regiment to fire a shot in the war. His wonderfully graphic picture of some of the events of that fateful day and the subsequent cavalry action at Eluge will be followed later by further instalments of his graphic narrative. Sunday the 23rd of August 1914 We had arrived at Toulon on the bank of the canal that stretches from Mons to Condé. We had no sleep or talking about for some days and already the first units of the British Army in contact with the enemy. On Saturday, Hornby, with a half a squadron, had got as far as Sonier, where from the church tower the field of Waterloo was just visible. They had pursued and charged some German cavalry, Bavarian ploughboys in German uniforms. That's all they really were. These boys carried long metal lances, like lengths of gas piping, and they could not manage. Some of these lads had been killed and three or four wounded and captured. Fair, resolute, genial and a keen soldier, Hornby with his troop, magnificently mounted, as indeed we all were, yelling at full charge, their long straight swords at glittering row of staley points, would have put fear into far more hardened soldiers. After 48 hours of almost continuous movement, we had finished up with a long night ride through the wretched slums of Framier, Wasmez and Padraigues. That ride had been a nightmare. Tin drizzle had turned the coal dust that lay everywhere into a greasy slime. Our horses, half asleep like ourselves, had staggered on, stumbling over the uneven cobbles and cinder heaps, slipping and falling on the endless network of tram and trolley lines. So on that Sunday we were all drowsy and slack, yet the tension in the air was unmistakable. Early in the afternoon there had fallen an ominous silence. Everyone and everything, even the great line of elm trees opposite our billets, seemed to be attentive, as if waiting for something to happen. A sense of impending disaster pervaded the silent village. We knew that the Germans were not far away. Twenty minutes afterwards we were engaged in the Battle of Mons. Five hours later we had begun on the long retreat. I shall not easily forget the overture of that extraordinary battle. At 3.30 on that sultry Sunday afternoon, there arose apparently about 800 yards in front of us a crackling sound exactly like the noise of an October bonfire into which a cartload of dry holly bells had been suddenly thrown. A fierce, steady crackle that grew ominously louder and angrier and nearer moment by moment. I had heard nothing like that in the Boer War. My heart sank. There surged over me the first and worst moments of dismay, of fear in the war. Afterwards I was partly indifferent to the danger from sheer exhaustion, nerve strain and fatigue, yet not seldom, like I think most others, I walked with fear or at least apprehension. A tall grey figure stalking by my side or never far away. The deep thunder of our own or enemy artillery fire could be stimulating, but the angry crackle of massed rifles I shall always loathe. The regiment mounted and we moved off a few hundred yards to the left and dismounted again. A German and English plane viciously firing at one another circled overhead. The infantry in the line ahead of us were evidently in for a hot time. We, as cavalry, were merely standing to for eventualities. Presently, wounded from the infantry regiments just in front of us began to limp and stagger down the road on our right. I left the regiment and walked over to some cart sheds just across the road, which I had already marked down as my prospective dressing station. My groom and servant and my corporal led our horses over and I knelt down in the shed to dress the first of the British troops who had been wounded. As I did so, the first bursts of German shrapnel were coming over with a venomous buzz like swarms of angry hornets. Soon I was up to my eyes and work, the knees of my riding breeches soaked with the blood that was running all over the place from those who were badly wounded. More and more, in twos and threes, sixes and seven, and then in streams, the wounded poured in. Some walking, some carried pick a back or in hand seats, and a few on stretchers. Manchesters and DCLIs and KOSBs and several other regiments. But where were their doctors? There seemed to be not a sign of one. I did not realise then the almost helpless task that the infantry doctors were engaged in. My orderly and myself made desperate attempts to cope with the streams of wounded men. The whole of the cart sheds were now full of wounded that lay or sat about in the mud and sodden straw. 
Every post was being clung to by those able to stand. Some slipped down and fainted. There were now streams of men, presumably wounded, passing right and left across the fields. I know not to where. It never occurred to me that anyone was retreating. More shrapnel was coming over, and our own horse artillery was replying. We must have been there for hours, but it seemed only a few minutes before we were lighting candles and lanterns to see what we were doing. So numerous now were the wounded that I could only find time to look at the worst, and then do little more to tighten an amateur tourniquet or plug a gaping wound in the chest wall with gauze, and give morphia in heroic doses to those who appear to be in the most pain. I got up and went out, a blaze of burning hayricks, and a bright glow from a hundred thousand rifles in rapid fire lit up the darkening northern sky just beyond some trees. Down the centre of the road on the other side, of which I had left my regiment, were coming streams of wounded, hopping, crawling, walking, or being carried. But the dry ditches on either side of the road, just outside my dressing station, were full of whispering shadows. What's the matter with you all there? I demanded. There was no reply from the huddled forms in the darkness of the ditch. I was really too weary to be indignant, but I pretended to be. If you don't immediately rejoin your regiments in the fiery line, I'll take every man's name and regiment and send him to his adjutant. You know what that means? Court martial for desertion in the face of the enemy. There was a silence and a few, only a few of the huddled forms suddenly emerged with their rifles and walked with a slow, depressed step back towards that pink glow and that hollybush crackling beyond the trees. Getting suddenly alarmed at all the possibilities, I hurriedly collected my gear and we mounted, leaving alas many wounded, some partly and others quite unattended. I left them in charge of a senior non-commissioned officer of infantry who was only slightly wounded. I reminded him of the most simple forms of tourniquets and giving him an armful of dressings, advised him when all the carts came back to move all the rest of the wounded to Tulin, the little village about half a mile back on the road behind us. This I think he did, for carts with wounded began arriving while I was attending to those already in the town hall there. This was not the only time in which it was quite impossible to fulfil my duty to the unit and to the wounded of other units. We entered a little town of Tulin in darkness and silence. Indeed, I was rather surprised how silent everything had suddenly become. There was but one building that had any light in it. As we passed it, I was besieged by a party of Belgian priests and nuns. Monsieur is a doctor, please come in at once. In here, there are many English wounded. There are no doctors, we do not know what to do. I dismounted and entered what was evidently the Marie or town hall. The steps were trodden with a jostling crowd of wounded. Many excited Belgian peasants and sisters of mercy were carrying in mattresses, straw, jugs of water and old sheets for bandages. The scene inside was one which I was soon to become only too familiar. It was packed with wounded, lying down, crouching or standing. The stairs were blocked with sitting cases. The passages were loaded with stretchers. There were several whose hastily applied tourniquets had eventually been slipped, lying in a dead faint from the loss of blood. Everywhere, lights and confusion and a babble of tongues, Cockney, French, Flemish and broken English. I spoke but little French and getting hold of the most responsible priests and the older Catholic sisters, I ordered them to keep the badly wounded cases on the ground floor and sell all the slightly wounded cases up to the rooms on the upper floors of the building. They had started doing the very reverse. But why, monsieur? Because in case of fire, you will never get the stretcher cases down again in time if you carry them up those narrow stairs. Fire? But why should it be a fire? The bad cases will be more comfortable upstairs. Besides, there are far too many slight cases to put in the small rooms above and some of the upper rooms are locked, half full of the town's records. Never mind, I said, burst the doors open. Let all the wounded who can walk go up and leave the stairs and passages free. They can sit down on the floor in the upstairs rooms. We began gradually to get the place in some sort of order. The palisades and mattresses which were being brought in, we arranged in rows. Straw had been put down where there was no mattresses, much too much straw. The harvest was just beginning. The sisters were giving the men cigarettes. I tried to dissuade them. Don't encourage them to smoke here or you'll soon have all the straw on fire. Soldiers, poor English soldiers, no smoke after such a brave battle. They gazed at me, astonished. I might as well have ordered to stop the men breathing. Soon I was terribly busy with the worst cases. Only two I can remember in all that confusion. One badly wounded in the head, yet conscious enough to point to the man laying next to him. Sir, that man alongside blew off his own right hand 
recharging a fuse to blow up the bridge across the canal which the Germans had captured. He went back alone of his own accord to do it himself. The first charge wouldn't go off. If he hadn't stopped, the Germans would have enfiladed our whole line. The men were, I think, both Royal Engineers. I dressed the stump of the hero of the bridge and hastily scribbled his name and number in my notebook. You won't be forgotten, I said. You deserve a VC. I'll see that the general hears about it. I was in the midst of giving instructions as to each wounded man, not injured in the stomach, having at least a litre of milk a day, when an excited sister seized me by the arm. Monsieur, monsieur, go at once. The Germans are here. Here? Yes, monsieur, in the street outside. No, no, not that way. By the side door to the right. Quick, quick. I dashed to the side door to find my groom and orderly looking pale and excited. They too had just seen the Germans, indeed had actually rubbed shoulders with them in the darkness outside. We all three flung ourselves on our horses and dashed away from the Murray, not knowing the least which direction to take. A light rain had begun to fall and the cobblestones were greasy. Shots behind added wings to her speed. Galloping madly in the darkness, slithering and skittering through those silent streets, we were nearly down half a dozen times. Where was everybody? What had become of the British Army? Why had nobody told me? Where were we galloping to? Où sont les chaussures anglaises? Où sont les dragons de la garde? I shouted through the echoing streets, the excitement playing havoc with my scanty French. There was no answer to my ill-judged questions, only shots and the echoes of our clattering hooves. Suddenly we were fired up at point-blank range from in front. The flash shot a group of dismounted cavalry on the left of the road. Someone shouted in French, Qui va là? The voice had an unmistakable English accent. Who's that? I shouted. I'm four Dragoon Guards. Ninth Lancers answered the voice. Where the hell have you come from? We had bumped into the rear troop of the rear guard of the Second Cavalry Brigade. Geoffrey Accord, I think it was, and his men who were guarding the railway crossing. There was a hurried explanation, and the sliding metal gauge rolled back for us to cross the lines. I frowned my regiment half a mile back in a soaking cornfield whose every sheaf drenched one as it touched it. No lights were to be shown and it was almost out of the question to lie down for the ground was sodden. We had only a few very light casualties in the regiment. Pat Fitzgerald and machine gun commander had his cheeks slid open with a bullet. I sawed up the wound several inches along by the screened light of a candle and he and I crouched behind the sheaf. The road past the field was crowded with Belgian peasants and their children hurrying away in the dark. For a moment or two I watched the refugees, trying to think what on earth could be happening. It was unbelievable that any part of the British Army should have begun to retire in the first few hours of Armageddon. Would not some of us be court-martialed? The Army and Navy had for years been looking forward in confidence to a sharp, decisive scrap with Germany. In the naval wardrooms I had visited and the military messes I had lived in, conversation constantly returned to that subject. We had all cheerfully been assured of victory, prepared to the last rangefinder, prepared to the last gator button. And now? Presently, a bright light flared up behind us. Some of the refugees turned, their white faces lit by the glare. What's that? I asked. It must be the town hall, monsieur. It's the only building of that size in Tulin. So the expected had happened. I've always had a horror of fires, especially in hospitals. I thought of that crowded building with so many nearly helpless men and confused and frightened priests and sisters of the suffocating blaze and smoke from the damp straw, khaki clothing and mattresses. How ghastly. But with all those men smoking, it needed no profit to foresee what was almost a certainty. And my VC hero, too weak from loss of blood from that jagged stump to walk, poor devil. He had looked his way to the sheet. Was he at that moment being burned alive? I fumbled for my notebook. At least this gallant soldier should have a posthumous honour. His mother and his relations, his corps and his country should know of his self-sacrifice. My notebook was gone. I had it in my hand when the sister warned me. That panic-stricken dash from the town hall, the mad ride over those greasy cobblestones, I counted only too easy for the loss. Should any Royal Engineer who fought near Toulon that night read these lines, possibly even now the man's name might be discovered. Perhaps he has already been posthumously honoured, or at best of all, possibly he escaped from the blazing building and was cared for by the enemy. As I learned afterwards, the Germans, all things considered, 
devoted great care and skill, sometimes even were very kind to our wounded. Gradually, our men were being pressed back to the outskirts of Illuge. It's August 24th. It's hard to describe clearly what happened or just when and where the trouble began. But as it concerns one of the most famous incidents from the retreat of Mons, it may be worthwhile to make some attempt, though I was but a puzzle spectator, not an actor. The difficulty in giving a clear account was increased by the confusing nature of the country. Within a radius of about 3,000 yards of Illuge and of one other lay at least six little villages. Anger, Angro, Augernay, Montenay, Anzenay and Vitrives. Similar in size, each situated in the little valley, their names having to English ears a similar sound. Outside each village, and as alike as two peas, were one or more little cemeteries surrounded with brick walls. In or near this area, strange to us, on that eventful morning, dotted as it was with conical slag heaps about 60 feet high, and intersected with many sunken roads, railways and trolley lines, no fewer than three brigades or 27 squadrons of our cavalry were active between 8 a.m. and noon, in addition to several battalions of infantry and many artillery units. If my account of what I saw appears confused, this must be my only excuse. It must have been about 11 a.m. when the brigade turned about at the shrine and rode back through the two villages toward the small cemetery of Wiris. The brigade halted twice. Artillery fire had begun on our right. This I supposed to be our guns on the hillside to the south and east of us. Then heavy firing began from the German line, that is, to the north and east, and also on our left. Some, not very much, shrapnel was coming over. I had the impression that an important move was about to take place, and as my position in an action should be alongside my old colonel, who was on ahead, I decided to overtake him. I saw him and a few of his staff turn up to the right and then halt. The remainder of the regiment, all three squadrons as I thought, turned to the left towards the Germans. I missed my groom and stopped for a moment to look for him. Then a squadron of the ninth who had just got in front of me turned about, and I had perforce, because of the narrowness of the lane, to turn about with them. They turned down to the right between two walls, and there they halted facing the Germans. I turned about again, intending to rejoin the headquarters of my own regiment. Instead of overtaking them, I found myself with some of the 18 Hussars, Riding up a slope above some railway lines towards our field and horse batteries were halted. The firing had become much heavier. Some of the cavalry were riding towards the railway lines between us and the Germans, making apparently for the tall brick building a sugar factory. A perfect hurricane of shelling began. Then the whole scene was blotted out in smoke and dust. Like most of the others, I had heard no orders, did not know a charge was taking place. I don't think anyone except those taking part in it did, and many of them told me afterwards they thought it was only a reconnaissance. The noise was now terrific. Shells were bursting higher up the hill. Some seemed to be skimming just overhead. With two mounted signallers and the man of the 18 Tazars, I rode in between two walls close to a cemetery where we sheltered. The broad slope of the hill above and behind to the south of us was now one white cloud of bursting shell. Then some of the 9th and 18th came galloping past us excitedly. Everybody seemed to be shouting, though the din was so deafening that we could not hear what they said. But with the signalers I followed some of them, only to find myself again in one of the villages we had passed through nearly an hour before. It must then have been about 11.30am. The Hussar, an officer servant, had followed after us. He and I rode up to the hilltop crowned by the little shrine at the fork where the roads. The artillery fire all around was very heavy. I could see troops moving down below me, across our front, but whether English or German, I could not be certain. Probably the Cheshires are part of our 19th Brigade. Unaware that my regiment, and indeed the whole brigade, were dispersed and disorganised, temporarily non-existent, I started off again to find them. Only by piecing together the conflicting accounts and experience of survivors did I manage during the next week to get a hazy idea of the day's events. At 10 a.m., the 2nd Cavalry Brigade, 16 or 1700 officers and men, dragoons, lancers and hussars, had been practically intact, yet before noon it was so broken and scattered as to be for the time being non-existent. By 7 o'clock that evening, about 200 men and a few officers had arrived in Virginie-le-Petit, 
believing themselves to be the only survivors. Whole batteries of horse and field artillery had apparently been exterminated. One account was that General de Lille, hearing that the 5th Infantry Division on our right was in difficulties and trying to extricate itself from the German attack, had placed his brigade at the disposal of the GOC to delay the advance of the Germans on our retreating infantry and prevent the capture of our field batteries, our brigade was to make some sort of demonstration in force. This was to be preceded by a reconnaissance of the ground by two troops of the 18th Hussars or the 9th Lancers. Either the orders were confused or confusing or the general's commands were given direct to the troops and squadrons concerned. Always a fatal mistake. Instead of being passed as they should have been through the regimental commanders, at all events, the true troops sent out to reconnoitre had been followed by practically the whole brigade. The Germans, seeing a comparatively large mass of cavalry suddenly let loose and galloping towards them, got a bad attack of nerves. Why? It's hard to understand, for the whole network of hedges, wire fences, allotments, trolley lines and other obstructions made it unlikely that our cavalry would ever reach either their infantry or guns but nearly every German gun within range had at once been put on that small area of which our cavalry were moving. Presumably to counter this, our field and horse artillery had also been compelled to open fire, thus disclosing prematurely and fatally their own position. They in turn had been hopelessly hammered by the German massed artillery. A first-class battle had in fact developed with the rapidity of a whirlwind from this muddled order, for the German infantry imagining themselves to be really threatened and also by this charge of British cavalry had taken it seriously and checked their advance. Every rifle and machine gun on their side was now blazing away at our desperate cavalrymen. What our men exactly did, indeed, what any of them did when they debouched from behind those walls into a perfect hurricane of shell and machine gun fire and the clouds of dust and ashes disturbed from the slight keeps, no one seems quite to know. Some eventually got over to the sugar factory from which they were soon driven out again by furious machine gun fire. Hundreds crashed among the railway lines. Horses tripped on the low signal wires or pitched headlong, breaking their riders' necks into ballast pits near the railway. Some even reached the hedge and wooden palings bounding the allotments on the far side of the railway, fairly terrifying the Germans, as the German told me afterwards in Cologne, by their reckless and meaningless onrush. Some few actually galloped under this terrific fire through a half circle of two miles and survived. The Vicomte de Vauvenure, our principal liaison officer, was blown to pieces with many of the four dragoon guards around him. Most of the other French officers attached to his reader killed or wounded. Major Tom Bridges' horse was shot under him and the bones of his face badly damaged as he crashed on the railway lines. Climbing into the sugar factory, at which half a dozen German machine guns were firing, he got out of a window, dropping onto the back of a riderless horse somehow got away. Although the casualties eventually turned out to be much less heavy than the first supposed, about 300 of our magnificent horses, many of them had come, I heard, from Rothschild's tables when the war broke out, had been killed. Many more exact, lucid and authentic accounts of this exploit must have been written, but that was all I ever heard. The London papers hard up for any cheering news transmitted this unfortunate affair into a magnificent charge of the Ninth Lancers, German Gunners Sabred. Colonel David Campbell, commanding the Ninth Lancers, was, as we were told, offered a VC on the strength of it all, an honour he is said to have had indignantly refused. I want my squadrons back again, not VCs or medals. He was afterwards awarded VC for great personal bravery. Oh, he's a f-